Final Fantasy Origins Strangers in Paradise is good. Like, really, really good. For the first time in a long time, I'm hopeful for the future of the Final Fantasy franchise. For some people, Final Fantasy VII Remake was when they regained their faith. While it was one of the best games I had played in a very long time, I held out hope because the developers had one of the best games in history to use as a base. Strangers of Paradise has no such foundation. Even still, it is an unexpectedly amazing experience, and it stands resolute as a testament to the quality of care the Final Fantasy series has finally been given again. Final Fantasy has struggled to find its footing in terms of combat for a while. While I personally love turn-based combat, I know people who think it's the most boring form of combat. The last mainline turn-based Final Fantasy game was 10, and in my opinion, that is why it is also the highest rated Final Fantasy game since it was released, and that includes 7 Remake. For many new gamers to Final Fantasy, that may come as a surprise, because all 10 is really known for nowadays is this. <laughs> However, as someone who did have issues with the decision to move away from turn-based, I loved Strangers in Paradise combat. If you came here only looking for one reason to play the game, then know that the combat is stellar. If you leave out every other aspect of the game, the combat is good enough to stand as the sole reason to play it. This is one of the most purely fun Final Fantasy games in the past decade. It's a bit slow to start, but when it does hit its stride, the combat really starts to flow. The combat centers around eight different weapons to choose from, each with their own unique style of combat. You have spears, fists, swords, great swords, maces, katanas, daggers, and axes. The biggest difference in combat you'll experience at the beginning is from weapon to weapon, but there is also a class system you'll be using to power up over time. You have several different classes specializing in slightly different combat styles, eventually leading to a variety of gameplay that outshines the different weapon choices, but that doesn't come until much later. The first thing you'll want to focus on is finding the weapon that suits you the most. The game's class structure makes sure to emphasize this. There are three different tiers of classes. The lowest tier is what I call the weapon class. The way you unlock these classes is by obtaining the weapon they correspond with and they can only use that type of weapon. Hopefully by the time you're ready to move on to the next tier of classes, you will know which weapon you like, because from the second tier up, most classes can use several different weapons. In order to unlock new tiers though, you have to level up different classes. So you can't just play the one you like the most, which is a good thing. Because if it were up to me, I would still be playing Lancer instead of doing this. While I think the main point of leveling a class is to get a higher tier of class, that's not the only thing you can get while leveling. There are also skills, boost to abilities, affinity to that special class, and so on. However, I played the game on the hardest difficulty, and I found no reason for any of these things besides to unlock the next tier of class. The class leveling structure isn't uncommon in Final Fantasy games. 10, 12, and 13 had something similar. The problem is that every time you level for a specific class, that class only buffs itself, whereas in the other games, it was making you stronger overall. I want to be clear, not every level needs to be important, but they should have just scrapped the leveling system altogether and made it auto-level. I prefer having the ability to fine-tune my leveling process over auto-leveling, but that never feels present here. The ability boosts are nice, but unnoticeable. They do things like give you 2% more damage, or make you take 2% less damage. That's cool, but it's not something you ever really notice. Gear is much more beneficial to these attributes than anything else, and you just lose that 2% boost when you abandon the class to go to the next higher tier class in a couple hours. The affinity system is also something that will likely never be explored by 99% of the player base. Affinity is really hard to explain, but I'll do my best. Affinity is shown as a percentage, which is stupid. <laughs> 
It's stupid because the max buff for the classes isn't 100%. It's closer to 400%. Each class has an affinity buff list of about 8 buffs or so, and each buff unlocks at a certain percentage of affinity. These buffs don't only exist if you're using the class either. If you have an affinity buff for a mage, it will carry over to a dragoon as long as you continue to have the same percentage of affinity when you are a dragoon. If this doesn't already sound overly complicated, it gets better. You won't be able to get the highest affinity rating until the end game, because the majority of your affinity rating comes from gear, and the best affinity rating gear is at the end game. Even then, the buffs are nice, but not spectacular. Just nice. There are also skills, but I never used the ones I could get through leveling. Skills cost mana, and mana is precious in this game. To go a little further into depth about the combat, there are three different kinds of abilities in the game and all of them cost mana. The first are skills. These are basically combo enders. These skills do way more damage than regular hits, but are usually outshone by the other two abilities. The second ability type is buffs. They have a wide range of utility from running faster to doing more damage, and you can use them as you see fit, and they carry over between classes. But even these pale in comparison to the class specialty, which comes ingrained in each class and is separate from the leveling process. While I said fighting is very heavily reliant on your weapon, that's because mana is a scarce resource. If you had unlimited mana, each class's specialty is all you would ever use, and you'd be overpowered no matter what class it was you were using. As an example, I love playing mages, so I use my mana on my class's specialty, magic. However, the difference between the lowest tier of mages' magic and the highest tier of sages' magic is staggering. So, while leveling provides some extra depth to the game, I felt its main purpose was to unlock the next tier of class. As I stated before, there are three tiers of classes. If you level your weapon classes, you'll eventually unlock the next tier, the advanced class. These have the more iconic classes like Black Mage and Dragoon. It's also when you start to feel the Final Fantasy core coming into the mix, jumping super high, healing party members, and in general starting to get a feel for the combat as a whole is when the game really starts to pick up. And it's only the second tier. It's when you unlock the final tier that the mayhem truly begins. Sage, Breaker, Paladin, Dark Knight, and more are all pure, unadulterated fun. Breaker has access to the skill Zantetsuken, which, if you have no clue, is literally the coolest attack ever created. Sage has the iconic Ultima skill, and that ability will make short work of literally every boss in the game, even on Chaos Mode. This is a mashup of powerhouses of the series and makes the advanced tier look pathetic only by comparison. To try and explain the difference between the first and last tier, I'll go a bit more in depth. The mage is the weapon tier class for the mace. With this class, you have access to four magic abilities, fire, water, lightning, and blizzard. Each cast costs one mana, and the longer you cast, the stronger the skill is for the same amount of mana. So an instant cast is fire, a short cast is fire, and a long cast is fire. -a. The sage has all of these magic skills and the same cast strength layout, so he can cast fire, fire, and fire. -a. He also has access to several white magic skills like Cure, Regan, Protect, and Shell. That's not the end either. Each time the Sage uses either black or white magic, he gets a buff that corresponds to that magic type. That's not the end either. Each time the Sage uses either black or white magic, they get a buff that corresponds to that magic type. These buffs make casting that magic much faster, but that's not all they do. Once you have three of each of the buffs, you unlock the true potential of the Sage, Ultima. Ultima costs no mana and eats up all of your black and white magic stacks, but it does this. This is the difference between the lowest and highest tier classes, and there are nine other classes besides Sage at the top of the food chain. While the gameplay has plenty of flaws, many I didn't touch on here, like the gear system, I see no reason to go into detail on all the flaws it has. That's just how good the highest tier of classes are. Seeing another Final Fantasy game that takes the feel of these classes and improves on it would be exhilarating, 
and it's part of the reason I have so much hope for the future of Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy has come a long way since its first installment. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's improved in every aspect. I personally think that they should re-embrace turn-based combat. But my thoughts aside, the new gameplay has been a huge success for me even though it's not turn-based. However, what they are innovating isn't the only thing that brings me hope. It's what they're starting to bring back. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. This quote is usually used to talk about how when you become an adult, you need to act like one and leave childish things behind. I think it is even more than that, and it explains the evolution of culture as a whole. As humanity grows, there is a tendency to look back on the past with disgust. Those graphics were awful. Those movies sucked. This character is bad. It's one of the easier ways we feel better about ourselves in the present. We look back on the people of the past, including ourselves, and believe we are more refined than they were. We believe ourselves above humanity's past and deem the things that were popular and exciting as lame and stupid. This isn't always, and in fact, very rarely the case. While this mindset is constantly leading us to the evolution of new ideas, it leaves behind good ones for little to no reason. One such idea, or in this case, one such character trope, is that of the edgelord. When Final Fantasy was reaching its peak popularity, characters had more edginess than they knew what to do with. Tall, dark, and brooding was an ideal many video game franchises would strive for, and Final Fantasy was no exception. In the industry, it eventually got to the point where you had characters with so much misplaced rage that they took the phrase, I hurt myself just to feel something to its logical conclusion and ripped a hole in their chest to see if they could see their heart beating. The straw that finally broke the camel's back is when the game Shadow the Hedgehog came out. You had a game with a fun-loving and spunky main character release a new edition, and this new edition was literally a red and black version of the main character. The public was asking how much edgier could video games even get. So, like any good thing, it was eventually ran into the ground. You would have more and more angst-filled characters to the point where they were memed on relentlessly. And when a game would be announced sporting a new edgelord, the internet would collectively sigh so hard, carbon emissions went up. Now, years later, they are a relic of a bygone age. We see something intensely popular that defines a point in a group of people's lives that has some quirk. And we pick it apart, piece by piece, because nothing is infallible. So the negative comments that people make are never wholly untrue. In the instance of Shadow, the critics jumped on the hate wagon as soon as he was announced. They believed he only existed because of edgelord culture. Forget the fact that he was a virtual one-to-one -one color palette of Eggman, the main bad guy of the game, and the grandson of the person who created Shadow. The people who liked edgelords had to accept some of the criticism, and the people who hated them were relentless. In the end, nothing brings people together like a meme. It helped the haters kill off something they didn't like, and it let fans put away childish things. Now, you could say that because there was such a backlash for the edgelord archetype, that it was a bad character trope to use in the first place. I disagree strongly. And there are some notable examples of this, specifically Final Fantasy examples. Amaranth, Auron, Cloud, Leon, Riku, Sephiroth, and Vincent. Some of these were the edgiest of edgelords, but ask yourself, were any of them bad? Most, if not all of them, are beloved, memorable, and most importantly, interesting characters. They are held up on a pedestal as iconic each and every one. Maybe some of you noticed this when I was going through this list and kudos, but did you notice that half of that list were from the same game? And not only were these three characters edgelords, they were the edgiest of edgelords from the best game in the franchise and arguably one of the best games of all time. I'm not saying that Final Fantasy VII has its edgelord trio to thank for its success, 
But damn if those aren't people's favorite characters from a series, excluding people from the Italian Senate, of course. What I am saying is that not only is the Edgelord a good character type, but it obviously shines through in the Final Fantasy universe. Why is this important, you may be asking? Well, because the Edgelord is back, baby. So I decided to become a sacrifice. I offered myself to the darkness and prayed to become chaos, hoping some band of heroes would defeat me and thus bring an end to this empty dream. Bullshit. That is what I assume is the end of the demo of the game. However, I'm not 100% sure on that because I didn't play the demo. I don't play demos because demos are for losers. And by losers, I obviously mean fiscally responsible individuals who like to know if something's good before spending money on a product so they don't end up wasting that money. <laughs> Betas. In that scene, we had seen the angsty teen type confronting the edgelord. She used the attack of existential dread, and it was not very effective. This is because existential dread type attacks are ineffective against the edgelord type Pokemon. It was obvious from the very first trailer we were getting an edgelord as the main character, and people loved it. It's nice to see Final Fantasy realizing some of the strongest tools in their past and using them instead of putting them away forever. They took an edgelord and put one in a primary role of their brand new games. Jack has a set of rough edges, and like most other characters in his archetype, we learn more and more as we get deeper into the story. Normally, I wouldn't spend so much time talking about a specific archetype, but it's minor details like this that help me look into the future with hope in my heart. 10 to 15 years ago, there was a very deliberate act to try and shake the stigma of the general public. Square tried to put behind childish things. However, who considers what is and isn't childish is what's truly important. Lulu from Final Fantasy X has too many belts. Every reasonable person who looks at Lulu knows this. But literally no one who enjoyed that game would take even a single belt away from her wardrobe. Final Fantasy's core strengths have always lied in the over-the-top way they do things, and Final Fantasy fans love it. Square seems to have begun to understand that again. They realize that public perception and fan perception are two very different things. Jack embodies the old spirit of Final Fantasy, and I love that he's here as more than just a parody. However, hope is something you hold for the future. And there's a reason why I'm talking about being hopeful for the future and not talking about why this game is a masterpiece. While this game isn't a masterpiece, it is still spectacular. If you haven't played it or you haven't finished it, we are fast approaching the point of no return. Very soon I will be spoiling major plot points of the game. I've talked about how this game has filled me with hope several times already, and it has. It really, really has. It's just that for all of Stranger Paradise's steps in the right direction, there's a glaring flaw, the storytelling. While the storytelling is, in my opinion, terrible, the game story is amazing. Also, while the game storytelling is abysmal, and it is, there is a reason for it, and I can at least appreciate why it's terrible, but a little more on that later. The game's story is based off of the original Final Fantasy. If you've never played it, then you will be playing with a disadvantage. It's an interesting premise, and Strangers of Paradise is a kind of prequel slash reimagining of it. In order to bring you up to speed, I will try to sum up the original game's plot for you. Four heroes appear to save the world. They're starting the journey by defeating a knight who captured a princess so that her father, the king, will repair a bridge that is impeding the progress of the journey. Once the knight is defeated, they set out to restore balance to the world. They do this by traveling the world and restoring power to the four crystals guarded by four monsters called the Four Fiends. Once the crystals have been restored, they need to defeat the fiend's master, Chaos. When the heroes finally encounter Chaos, it is revealed that he is the knight they defeated at the beginning of the game. When the heroes defeated him, he was saved by the four fiends being sent back 2,000 years. He then sought power to eventually defeat the heroes of light, causing the current day's events. He is then defeated and the world is at balance once again. The story is actually quite good for how little storytelling they have in the game, and I recommend it if you haven't played it. 
You don't have to take my word for it either. The game was meant to be Square's final game before going bankrupt. It was obviously successful enough to create dozens of sequels and spin-off games, helping push Square into the powerhouse publisher position it holds today. Strangers of Paradise gives us a unique look at the original game. Talking about the game's story will be difficult to do spoiler-free. There are mysteries presented to the player from the first few seconds of the game that I can't talk about critically without spoiling answers to those mysteries. So this is the final warning. Leave if you have any intention of playing the game. However, don't forget to subscribe so you can take a look again at this video after beating it. Now, I've spoken cryptically up to this point to let spoiler-free watchers get as far as they could before going into it, but the reason the storytelling sucks is explained by the story. The main character, Jack, and his companions are a part of an advanced race of beings called the Lufenians. The world the humans are living in are a kind of creation of the Lufenians. The Lufenians use Jack to balance the forces of light and darkness in the world so that the Lufenians can harvest it of its energy. The Lufenians are more like gods than humans, so if Jack dies, they can just revive him. If the world falls out of balance and threatens to never be in balance again, they can destroy it and start it over. To the Lufenians, the lives of the humans in the world mean nothing. They are just a power source. While Jack and his companions are a part of the Lufenians, they don't exactly know it, and neither will the player. They carry around crystals that steal their memories from them. Huh. Mine's going crazy to help them carry out their tasks. The Lufenians don't want Jack to get too attached to the animals that he may have to slaughter. This is the reason the storytelling is bad, because everything that happens means something. Every time you die, it's technically canon. Every time a character seems to know more, this is the reason. If something seems off, it's likely that the scene that would have explained it in your playthrough happened, but Jack forgot about it. So you never actually saw it happen when you were playing, leading to confusion. It's a very cool idea, and it's been done successfully in stories before, but the presentation falls very flat here. It will be very obvious that the game is hiding something from you in the very first scene. Instead of showing you scenes that Jack forgets, and then showing him having no memory of them, they cut the scenes out entirely. That way you don't even know if you miss something. This makes for a very jarring story experience. The first five minutes of the game story just sucks. It is outright terrible, to the point where I literally laughed when I started playing and asked out loud, what the fuck is even going on here? Jack takes the quest from a king to defeat some monsters to earn the right to go fight chaos. The embodiment of the darkness and the entire scenario is summed up by showing Jack on a boat and then him in front of a castle with his companions being like, we did it. Again, there are reasons for this. The crystal has removed these memories because they're non-essential. But not having this experience made the game worse for a major reason. You don't know the crystals are taking his memories. So it just seems really, really lazy. I would have enjoyed doing the mission they seemingly did without me. I would have enjoyed the character building and growth that meeting everyone would have presented for me. And their choice to do it like this made me significantly more critical of the story from the get-go than I otherwise would have been. Not knowing it was memory loss made me think that it was just really bad writing. Whereas you could have achieved the same goal with better results if the memory loss had been shown more subtly. Jack could meet a woman after a particularly gruesome battle in a town who laments about her son dying to a monster he just killed. Maybe she's placing flowers on a set of gravestones where the attack happened. Then an hour of gameplay or so later, after waking up at the inn in town, he runs into her again, and her son is alive with no gravestones present in the same area they were before. The mother could say something like, oh, I want to thank you again for saving us all from that monster before he reached our town, with the player knowing that the monster was fought inside of the town. She then says, who knows what could have happened if it had gotten here. Jack says, don't mention it, and then they leave. One of the companions asks if he knows that lady, and he replies, I've never seen her before in my life. This scene could even be further reinforced by passing by the town again later. Seeing the gravestones you saw in the first scene with the son crying instead of the mother. And a companion could say offhandedly as they are walking through, I wonder what happened here. This is one scene of many that could take place. It shows the world state is constantly changing, but you don't know why. 
Jack and his companions are also forgetting things that the player remembers. Because they can't even remember the town they just saved. What we get instead is an entire section of story ripped away. And while this puts us into Jack's shoes a little better, it doesn't make for a good story-consuming experience. It just adds a sense of wrongness to the story you can't quite put your finger on. However, this wrongness is for everyone who plays the game no matter what. There is actually a much more obvious layer of heavily implied wrongness to the world that only a few players will know about. Anyone who played the original Final Fantasy game would know that things are off in a very interesting way. But to a player who has never touched the original Final Fantasy, the entire game will be missing that extra layer. The developers are not committing some terrible atrocity by making the game mandatory for the full experience, but I think that having the story be so heavily influenced by the previous installment needs some in-game outlet. The princess isn't captured. Chaos becomes a new companion. The crystals aren't helping people. People think that chaos could potentially not even be real. There is a laundry list of ways the game is similar but different before you even get to the true going-ons of the story. And this is just left out there without trying to tie it in for new fans. Is this a problem? I think a lot of people would say outright no. That a game should never pander to everyone, and generally, I agree. But the issue with Strangers is that the vast majority of people who had played this game and beaten the original did so more than five years ago. So you're not just causing issues with new players, you're causing unnecessary confusion with the target audience as well. While I'm being harsh on this game, and in my opinion not unfairly, this is a video about hope, not disappointment. Strangers in Paradise has terrible storytelling, and I will believe that until the day that I die. However, no game can be boiled down to a single moment. <clears throat> Almost no game can be boiled down to a single moment. I said Final Fantasy's core strengths have always lied in the over-the-top way of doing things. I don't like the storytelling because it's way too over-the-top. However, Square is finally sticking to its strengths. The game starts with the characters wearing regular clothes, but it immediately changes to fantasy clothes. You fight a bad guy that turns into a girl wearing a sailor uniform. You have that main character going on and on about chaos. You have jarring cuts in the story that leave the player confused. Strangers in Paradise is a game about extremes. Is it a masterpiece? No. But Final Fantasy is the flagship of the Square Enix Empire, and when turning a ship, you have to do it one degree at a time. If you had asked me what ship I thought Final Fantasy was before I played this game, I would have told you the Titanic. In my eyes, the mainline Final Fantasy series had been dead in the water for a very long time, and it was just a matter of time before it hit the iceberg at full speed. That's starting to change. Now if you ask me, I would tell you I consider it the Starship Enterprise, boldly going to where no one has gone before. Will it usher in a new era of peace and prosperity, or unlock an Armageddon that finally bankrupts Square for good? Only time will tell, and I think we'll be learning the answer very, very soon. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you thumbed that like button, essentially, as you can. And if you want to continue being entertained, click this video here to see arguably the best video on my channel. Bye bye